So thank you, Ivo, for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, the story I'm going to tell to you is related to what we just heard about modeling three-dimensional structures of chromosomes. But in this case, we are focusing on modeling it using spatial restraints. And that is something that is not new, has been used for ages probably by the uh, NMR people for uh, determining the structures of RNA or other macromolecules, DNA, and proteins. But we are trying to focus on the DNA at the lower resolution than atomic, and I haven't started to tell you that. This is something that has been done mostly in our group by David Baou, a postdoctoral fellow who is sitting here. If you guys want to talk to him later on, you can do as well. In collaboration with a lot of experimentalist people, mostly with the Job Decker group, and I'll tell you what uh, the Decker group is doing at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, also the Jane Lawrence, also at UMass. And then the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk uh, something that we haven't published yet. I was asked to, to give you more insight in things that you cannot read yet. Uh, and this is something that we're doing with your charge at Harvard University and Lucy Shapiro at Stanford University. And this will be my second part of the talk. But I think this slide here is very, it's very crucial for you guys to understand what type of things we are looking at. At the high resolution end, uh, and, and this was already introduced by, by Zhang because his uh, visualizer can go from atomic resolution to chromosome territories, and this is very nice actually for people like myself who is doing 3D modeling and wants to see the things. But anyway, at the atomic resolution, we have a fair of information available to us through the proteins and the DNA that has been already crystallized or solved by NMR spectroscopy. At the other end, we also have a a large amount of information given mostly by the people who does microscopy, either light microscopy or electronic microscopy. And we know there are chromosome territories and some other features that the chromatin and the DNA are having in, in the interface nucleus. In between these two extremes, there is a gap in the resolution that they call a gap in, uh, resolution in the gap, in, a gap in the resolution because we don't know very well what is happening in between. And this is where we, we're going to be focusing today in understanding how the DNA in the interface nucleus tries to adopt a three-dimensional structure at this level of resolution, okay? Which is somewhere in between the supposed to be 30 nanometer fever, which is not clear. Uh, lately has been some controversy about whether it exists or not in living cells, and what is called the higher order chromatin folding. And this is where we focus. And we focus, as I mentioned to you, by doing this approach on determining the three-dimensional structure is determining and not predicting, because we don't make many guesses in here, but we try to determine the structure based on experimental data using spatial restraints. And this is, we do it using the interactive modeling platform, which is a piece of software that is developed mainly at the Shelley Lab at UCSF, and we contribute to it with two modules, one for RNA, which I'm not talking about today, and another one about chromatin. Basically, the idea is, if you understand this, you will understand what it means. It's very simple. This is NMR spectroscopy. In NMR, the three-dimensional object, in this case an RNA molecule, is represented by a two-dimensional observation of it, which is a 2D noisy data. And the 2D noisy data is telling us which amino acids are in, this, in, the, in the sequence and what is the distance between them. And when you have all this information in place, the only thing that you have to do is to identify a three-dimensional object that satisfies as much as possible all the distances that you obtain from the two-dimensional representation of the object. What we do in this experiment is exactly the same, but instead, of course, using NMR, we use 3C-based approximation, the chromosome conformation capture-based method. In this case, the two examples are all based in 5C and there are other approximations, three flavors of 4C, we have heard about high C, and so on and so forth. But we use 5C. Basically, all these 3C-based methods are telling us one thing. How often a pair of pieces of DNA interact in a population of cells? And that is represented here by a two-dimensional matrix, where blue means a lot of interaction, of course, across the diagonal. I interact with my neighbors. And of diagonal interactions, those are the interesting ones to bring this three-dimensional object into, into the third dimension. So we use this 5C data, which uh, basically, and with very lame words, it does is, this is what uh, 5C is doing. 
you can read a lot on the papers by Becker and other people, of course, and, and, and they have a website for designing this type of experiments. Basically, you have a cell, uh, a population of cells, typically about a million cells. You throw formal deal to do some cross-linking in there, then you cut that those two pieces of DNA, the, the orange and the blue, get cross-linked by the formal deal. Then you cut with your favorite enzyme, enzyme of restriction, which in this case, HIN3. You get this sort of pieces in the population. You ligate the extremes, purify the DNA, and then through this software, you can design primers, specific primers, that will go and uh, make annealing, ligate them back, rescue them, and sequence them by the next generation sequencing technologies. Basically, at the very end of this exercise, what you get is a very quantitative measure of how these two pieces of DNA were interacting in quantitative measures. So, for example, fragment number one in my piece of DNA that I investigate and interacts 100 times with fragment number 10, but only 10 times with fragment number 1,000. This type of, of information. What we do in the computational part is we take this two-dimensional matrix of interactions, mean, blue means lots of interactions, yellow means little interactions, and we just transform this into points and restraints in the space. Two points that interact a lot, they were in the blue area, they should be close in the space, this is an assumption. Two points that do not interact, they should be far away in the space. It's again another assumption. The way that we go from interactions to distances it's, it's some, uh, it requires some assumptions about the data. I'm not going to go into details there because I want to tell you about the biology that we can get from the models. But if you guys are interested, uh, we can talk later on or during the questions. When, when you have the system represented by points and restraints, you put it into an uh, optimization protocol. We use Monte Carlo simulated annealing. Get an ensemble of solutions which has a lot of different variability. We have heard by, uh, by Bill that there is a, the DNA moves a lot. And basically, that is observed by the amount of different solutions that we get for a particular experiment. Then, using additional experimental data, validate it and get a final answer. So, or, or a set of, of final answers, actually. So, I'm going to tell you the two stories that we have done. Very briefly, what we have published in this Natural Structure Molecular Biology paper that we are highlighting today. And then, the last part of my talk will be focusing on another uh, application that we have done. We, play, we, we work with the alpha globin domain on the human genome. This is a very small piece of the human genome, only half a megabase, so 500 kilobases. At the beginning of chromosome 16, this is the 1D representation. The genes, alpha globin genes, are here. And the reason why we choose the alpha globin domain is, is double. One, it has been a model system for the people who works on trying to understand the higher order folding of, of, of the chromatin. And two, we have a wealth of data from the ENCODE project that then we can map into the models and see whether the models make sense or not, given the amount of biological data that we have collected from the ENCODE project. We have done that experiment in two cell lines. The first cell line basically does not have the alpha globin genes activated. They are silenced. There is no RNA coming out from those genes. On the other cell line, the red one, K562, there is a lot of activity going on in the expression of those genes. So we wanted to see whether there is a difference in the structure that can tell us something about the expression of those genes. And here you see the models that we get. GM cell line, no expression of the alpha globin genes. K562 cell line, expression of the alpha globin genes. You can see that we observe very different three-dimensional structures. And this is yet another visualization at the low resolution, equivalent to somewhere in between these two extremes that we have seen before by the Genome 3D viewer. I'm going to go very briefly to that, but basically we have observed difference in the structure. We observe one globule here and two globules here. All the data that we collected from the ENCODE project match very nicely the models. That is telling us that wherever there is a high level of expression in K562, there is also a local condensation of the DNA, well, condensation, local proximity of the DNA in that region. That matches very nicely with co-expression of the genes. In the center of these globules, we get mostly active genes and promoters. We are not enriched in the center of these globules by 
inactive gene, whatever inactive means, that there, are, there are no genes or no promoters in those regions. The models were validated at least partially by fish imaging by the Lawrence group, and you can read about that into our Nature Structure Microbiology paper. We believe that in these centers of mass, in these globules, there will be an analogous of a transcription factory, but we cannot say because we haven't looked at proteins, only at DNA. Finally, uh, what we came up after this is this chromatin globule model right here that, of course, the chromatin, or, or basically says the chromatin condensates around a uh, globule core, probably with the analogous of transcription factory. Active genes will be in the center. Inactive pieces of DNA or pieces that apparently are not doing much for the transcription are in the sites. When this gets saturated, there has been studies indicating that there are about seven to eight polymerases in there, RNA polymerases. When that gets saturated, the cell has to find a second globule somewhere, and that is why we get, we believe, we get two globules when you have a lot of activity and only one globule for the other cell line. This matches very nicely things that has been seen before. So this, you guys can read in the papers. This paper here talks about the biology of the system. In supplementary materials, you get a hint of what we did computationally speaking. That other paper, Chromosome Research, gives you a bit more details. We're writing a third one that will give a full release of the, of the way we do uh, this modeling. But the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk something about a, uh, the Caulobacter crescendos. That would be uh, uh, a full three-dimensional model based on the same approximation of a prokaryote uh, genome, the full genome. We haven't published that yet, but we hope it's going to it's going to get out soon. This is a genome that has about four uh, megabases. It's relatively small, can be treated with 5C approximation. You don't need high C for that amount of DNA. It has about 3,700 uh, 3, genes. And it's a circular genome. It has an origin and a term, and it's a completely circular. It's a closed circle. But, but the first thing that we did is, uh, uh, in collaboration with the George Chat Lab, Mark Umbargan, a student in the, in the lab of George, uh, did the uh, analysis of the 5C data. In this case, we get a pretty high uh, resolution data, 340 fragments. These are the fragments left after a strip, uh, 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 digestion with the enzyme. In average, about 13 kilobases per fragment. That would be our uh, experimental uh, resolution, 13 kilobases per point in the space that we use. If that is a circular, a perfect circle genome, this is a uh, simulated data that you would get in, in 5C. Again, ORI, TER, ORI, that goes in that direction. The uh, ORI and the neighbors around the diagonal will be interacting because the, it's a polymer at the end of the day, and, and I'm interacting with my neighbors. And then the origin and, and the two origins will be interacting as well. No much interaction in between them if that would be a perfect circular. But when we did, uh, when the George uh, Charles lab did the experiment and with help of Jörg Decker, they got a cross, a perfect cross. That was uh, right away very interesting. Because that basically is telling us that five, uh, the, the chromosome is ellipsoidal. And so far, it's starting as a ellipsoidal, and you can see it here. For example, if we take interrogation of first megabase in here, that will be represented in here. I interact with my neighbors. That's the peak of interactions, 5C data peak. Then I do not interact either with TER or ORI. Those will be the valleys. And of course, I interact with the guy that I have in front in the other arm, and that will be somewhere around the three uh, megabase, the third megabase. But, but it's really an uh, ellipsoidal. Yes, it is ellipsoidal, but when we did the three-dimensional modeling, it turned out to be as well helicoidal. So again, we take this data. Here rep I represent only five points in the space. Each point is a, is, a, is a fragment left after digestion. If two points interact a lot, I'll put them together. If two points do not interact, I'll put them apart. But of course, we do that with 339 points and thousands thousands of relationship between them. We throw them in the space randomly. We do Monte Carlo simulation. We end up with one possible solution. In fact, we do that 50,000 times, and each one of them, we collect the 10,000 most uh, 
uh, uh, lower IMP objective function that is equivalent of saying the ones that satisfies most of the restraints that you put in the space and then you cluster them and you get this sort of cluster of solutions that will be the equivalent in NMR of an ensemble of solutions. Now let's focus a bit. Uh, let's focus first here. This is one problem that we haven't solved yet. It's not a terrible problem, but it's something that we have to solve, which is the mirroring problem. Of course, we are at the distance space, not the Cartesian space. We only look at distances between points, and my two hands here have the fingers at the same distance between them, but they are mirrors of each other. So I don't know which is the correct solution, unless I put a third point of reference somewhere. We haven't done that. But we get four different solutions in this modeling exercise. Cluster number one is a perfect mirror of cluster number two. Cluster number three is a perfect mirror of cluster number four. And cluster number three is a half mirror of cluster number one. So the first half is identical, but the second half, sorry, the first half is mirror, the, the second half is identical, and so on and so forth. So it's difficult to differentiate between these solutions. We give all of them, but pay attention, these are mirrors. Nevertheless, we can look at these models and tell you some bio biology about it. First of all, always in all different models, the most polar side across the long axis of the cell, and by the way, the models fit very nicely into the shape of a Caulobacter crescendo cell, which we haven't used in this case. The polar side is not the origin. It's about 25 kilobases away of the origin, but always appears in the most polar point. The terminus is somewhere here, but the point, the most polar point is this, this side, or at least the fragment that contains the this side, which is 47 kilobases away from the third. So basically, there is a rotation of about seven degrees of the chromosome with respect to the origin and term. Parasite is responsible for anchoring the chromosome into the membrane, and that is known in, by the biology of many people in, in Caulobacter. And this side is responsible for resoluting, separating the chromosomes during replication. This is also well known in the biology. So that fit very nicely in our models. Or our models fit very nicely the biology that was known. To test further this, the, 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 the importance of this parasite, which binds these two proteins that are responsible for the anchoring, the, the charge lab made a, a mutant, ET166, in which these four kilobases, 40 kilobases, uh, 400 kilobases, sorry, were moved or translocated completely. So now, what was in here is now in here in the chromosome and vice versa. And that cell line go up nicely, so that the cells survive, it's, it's okay. they are happy with it. But this is the uh, original matrix that we get in the, in the first the wild type experiment, and this is the one that you get when you do this translocation it translates the cross about 400 kilobases. So it seems like the chromosome is still helical, and it is, when we model it in three dimension, still ellipsoidal, but it has completely rotated this 400 kilobases so that now the parasite is again at the most polar position in the cell, okay? So parasite is driven it to there. They did another mutation, and I'm not going to tell you, in which now they took this parasite, only the parasite, and put it back in here again in the origin, and again the cell brings back the chromosome with only the parasite being moved. All the stuff that we can get from the wild type as well from, from the mutation is that around this parasite there is a, a high density of DNA, so it seems that the chromosome is more packed in there. That also has been observed experimentally, we look at the three-dimensional models and we see density, and this is actually the compaction score that we calculate versus the genome position, high compaction score at, at the uh, OE site, or the Paris site, basically. Another thing that is interesting is this equidistant amount of DNA in each one of the arms. Even though the arms have a slightly different conformation as they go from ORI to term, the amount of DNA that you get in which one of them, as you go across the long axis, is exactly the same. And this is important because the replication of Caulobacter crescendus goes in parallel through the two arms. So this is essential for the cell. In fact, the second wild type had a lot, the second mutation had a lot of deviation 
from this equidistant diagonal and that actually created problems to the cell for surviving. Basically, what I think we are accomplishing here, and I hope I have convinced you guys, is by developing some sort of a technology, which is in this case half experimental, done by, uh, with our collaborators, and half computational, done, done in our group, we can uh, start looking at the three-dimensional structure and go to function, so from sequence to function. This technology has allowed us to differentiate the different states or different possible conformation of the Caulobacter castendus, give some biology about the importance of the parasite and, and some other regions. I'm not telling you a lot of other stuff. And that we got some hypotheses that we have tested with fish imaging by the Lawrence, uh, sorry, by the Shapiro group that match very nicely also the modeling. So from sequence to function. If you guys are interested in this field, as, as we heard today uh, in, in, in the previous talk by Zhang, this is a field that is merging. We just published this uh, article two days ago in PLOS Computational Biology. I'm very happy that it came out uh, before our talk here. It's uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Leonid Mirny, who was the person who helped Job Decker in the science paper on the high seek data. This PLOS Computational Biology outlook, you can read here, we actually highlight of the, all the work that has been previously done, or at least the one that we could detect, it, starting from the Muir 2008, the Dosti and Blanchett lab had several approximations, of course, the science paper by Decker, Lander, and Mindry, and of course, the Nature paper by, by Novel, who's here, and our article, recent article in Natural Structure Microbiology. So let me finish by acknowledging who actually did the work. David Baru, who is, is the postdoctoral fellow in our group, is, is, is uh, uh, it's very important for this project to move on, and, and he will be in the near future looking for a second postdoc somewhere. So if you guys are interested in somebody that knows this stuff or, or IMP, he will be uh, soon available. The Decker lab and the Lawrence lab help us uh, to get into this field. That, that's a field that is new for us. I, I, I was working on proteins for many, many years, but this is something new for us. Lucy Shapiro and George Chart help us in the second paper that they hope soon is going to be accepted. We are in, under revision for that. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, guys. If you want to hear more or, or learn more about our group, we are, we're going to have open position soon for continuing this type of work. You can go to our website. For those of you who are interested in IMP, go in there and download IMP and, and use it if you guys want. And then I'm trying to put together some sort of a website where people can pitch in and I welcome everybody here to pitch in to see how are we moving this field in the future and collecting all this data and, and, and storing this data and releasing it to the public domain. Thank you very much.